This is the fourth episode in a special series of The Producers. Agriculture 2023 celebrates the farmers and produce of Northern Tasmania. In five conversations, we celebrate farmers caring for both land and community. Along the way, you'll hear how strong local food systems and ethical farming not only foster delicious food, they also benefit farmers, eaters, and the earth we all share. This is The Producers. I'm Danny Vallant. Everyone says that their truffles are all, all like anything, any industry, theirs is always better than someone else's. So, you know, we hope that we hope the customers think that the Tassie ones are better than, than everyone else's. So um, it's a, I, I don't think our productions aren't as high as what Western Australia are, but we hope that our quality is, is up there. Jeff Anderson and his wife Louisa moved from the Northern Territory to take on Truffles of Tasmania, the state's largest truffle farm, 50 hectares in the foothills of the Great Western Tiers, planted with truffle-friendly oak trees. It was a romantic vision with family as a priority. The farm is blessed with rainfall and extremely pretty, and trained, talented truffle dogs came with the purchase. But farming is tough. Has it been a dreamy tree change? We are, my name is Jeff Anderson and we're at Needlesdale, which is Needles, which is about 10 kilometres out of Deloraine, so northwest Tassie. We, um, it's the original for this, for this area. It's actually got the original old house um, and it ran all the way down to Needles as an old railway siding. We primarily, we've got uh, um, truffles, so there's around about 75 acres of truffles. Um, it's currently the largest truffle farm in, um, in Tassie. So it was, a, it was the second largest in Australia there at one stage. I'm not sure what's going on in Western Australia anymore. So we're starting to diversify the farm. So the farm's actually now, we're going into a bit more livestock. Um, also, so there's obviously grazing and there's also um, uh, improved pastures. So there's a few crops that we've done in the past, so, but primarily it'll end up being um, back to cattle and, um, and truffles. Most people don't know an awful lot about truffles, and even those that farm them soon learn that they're a mercurial crop. How did a Northern Territory Sparky come to buy a truffle farm in Northern Tasmania? Um, so my wife and I, we bought the property um, nearly two years ago. Uh, we were actually in, lived in Northern Territory. Um, I'm an electrician, so we had an electrical business up there. Um, and there was a slight tree change that we did. We've got, and we had two, well, we've got two young children. So we decided that we um, needed to prioritise education. And so we made the big move down to Tasmania. We landed in Tassie before, um, before COVID. We came down here for a 40th birthday of a close friend of ours. And by the time that Louisa left, she was harping on me, let's move to Tasmania. So it was sort of, it moved from there. There was, with COVID lockdowns, Northern Territory and Tassie obviously didn't have, weren't affected as badly with COVID. So yeah, we, we were down here doing holidays quite a lot. Um, we had purchased a property previously in Tassie. So then we decided that this was what we we're going to do. So we eventually we pulled the pin in Northern Territory and moved down here. We had absolutely no idea about truffles. Um, we were fortunate with the um, with the farm. We um, Mark and Julie uh, they work here, so Mark's been here since the property was actually originally put together around about twenty years ago. So he actually planted a lot of those trees. So yeah, with his knowledge, it's obviously it's come a long way in, in, in teaching us. So there's been obviously we've we've used outside as well. So we've um, got an agronomist there on board as well. So yeah, a lot of research reading. It's a very very attractive property. It's from a rainfall point of view. It's it's got a very it's a fairly safe safe property where it is. It's got the western tiers just sitting right there. So we are we're slightly colder, but we're also a fair bit wetter than a lot of other regions. So it was well. There's no such thing as safe farming, but we were we were aiming for something that actually had you know slightly on the safer side of it for for climate. So the truffles were there and as I said, we, we knew nothing about them, but we're, we're not scared of a challenge. So off we went. How's the learning been? Steep. <laughs> Steep. Um, yeah, it's been, it has been, it's, it's been the sort of thing that we started from zero. So I suppose we could hopefully only go, go up from there. So it's been an education and like anything, you never stop learning. Truffles aren't like the Northern Territory's mangoes. 
you can't see them growing and you never quite know what the crop is going to be like. So how do you turn the mysterious truffle into a commercial enterprise? The, the fact that it's, it's not like a fruit where you can look at a crop, you can't see the crop, you don't have no idea what the crop's going to be like at the beginning of the season. You go, into the, you go into a harvest with the hopes and aspirations that it's going to be a full bumper crop. You still pump the same amount of money into a good crop as what you do into a bad crop. So that's, that's a, a fairly challenging thing that you don't know and it's very hard to try and guess where it's going to go. So that's been the, probably the biggest eye opener. Um, apples, you can see them growing on a tree. Mangoes, which is obviously Northern Territory, we, we used to see it. We could see where the, the crops were. Um, this year, we still look at the same bit of, bits of dirt that what we saw at the start of the season. You have no idea. It all looks the same. The annual truffle cycle is about preparation, waiting, wishing for frost, waiting and harvest. And at every step, a lot of hoping. Jeff talks through truffle timings and logistics. So from the beginning, so once we finish the existing crop, so we'll finish harvesting, we've got around about two months to get what we have to do for preparation. Um, the You want to be out of there by around about November. Um, we can't be driving up and down paddocks um, and, and disturbing soil from that moment on. So it's a bit of a rush tear. Once we finish somewhere in September, we'll say early September, um, you've got September, October, you don't want to be back on those crops um, in any way after that. So you've got eight weeks to pretty well wave your magic um from there it's it's just keeping soil consistency for watering um fertilizing and then obviously weed management so it's a it's a constant it's the two months you come off three months of harvest which is rip tear bust two months of preparation for the next year then you can sort of start calming so it's a it's a fairly manic five months um all the all the dairy farmers around us they obviously dread having a frost we sit there and wish on the fro and hope the frost come and they come in with a lot of vigour. So we need those frosts to actually to bring on the, the ripening of the truffles. Harvesting is where the, the, the dogs, the, the happy little dogs, are actually start making their money. Um, they sit idle for about nine months a year, um, eating, and, and we take them for their regular jogs. But they, other than that, they um, yeah, they're, they're for cosmetic value only for that nine months. So, yeah, the dogs, obviously, the thing is before the season, we have to get the dogs ready. So it's, it's making sure that from a fitness point of view that we do take them for runs. Um, and then we start trying to do a few little training exercises for them just to make sure that their heads are actually in it. Um, staffing is also, obviously, like any industry, staffing is always a problem. Um, we need to make sure that we get the right people doing it. It's, a, it's an expensive product. The last thing we want to do is having people who are untrained um, or just not suitable. Um, it's, you can't just pair a person and a dog. A person has to actually bond with that dog. So there's some dogs there that I get along fantastically with and there's others that I don't. So there's, there's one dog which would probably be our best dog. Um, he and I just clash. Um, so I don't use him. There's no point in me using a dog that's, that's not suited. So when you're getting staffing, you've got to make sure that the right person is matched with the right dog. And that can be a bit of swapping and changing. So it's a challenge. But yeah, we, we obviously go through the season. Um, it's Tassie's traditionally a wet, wet winter. So we've got to try and juggle the wet, the cold, um, the whole lot. So we've, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a logistical nightmare really. So the dogs, the, the, obviously the hunter and the dog will go out. Um, the dog is primarily, obviously, it just wants its, its reward. So it's a food-based reward um, system. They're trained very similar to your customs dogs and the, the, the drug dogs and things like that. So thereafter, they've trained that if they get, if they find what they've been, obviously the target is, which in this case is truffles, they get a reward. Um, the customs dogs, they're actually trained for a, a entertainment. So they get a, a towel and they, they get a play. So these ones here for us, ours are all just food-based rewards um, and we use like a sausage and cheese. Um, we, don't, we don't use a um, dog nut because it's too salty and they also swell. So by the time they'd finished a day, they'd be full and also been, <coughs> excuse me, salty, they would um, potentially be dehydrated. So that's the, that's the thing. So the dog and the, um, the hunter go out, they will then, the, the start of it, normally the first half an hour is a little bit 
touch and go. They can um, the dog needs to concentrate. It'll do its traditional morning morning exercises of of wheeze and poos. But once they start, then they go through. We go through to Smoko. It's the whole idea is that the dog is to go through. It, once it finds, it'll actually just do a light paw. So it's just a, a slight mark on the ground. It's important that the actual hunter is very focused because if they're if they're sitting there on their phone or, or listening to music or something like that, they'll miss the little keys. There's there's cues that the dogs give. Um, you need to be concentrating at all times. So it's it's quite it's it's taxing on the dogs, but it's also taxing on the people walking just the walking alone, but also concentrating on the dog up and down all day. Um, it, it takes its toll on knees and backs. So it's. It's got a great novelty factor that people love to see, but yeah, the, after a few days, it's um, it's like anything, it's a job. So what they'll do is they'll go through, they'll mark the soil. Um, the hunter will go down and he'll actually pick up the soil around that there. Um, he'll have, have he'll have a, a sniff of it. And what, what he's chasing is the aroma. He wants aroma in the soil. If there's an aroma in the soil, that's an indicator that the truffle's actually um, ripe. If it's not ripe, then we don't, we just cover back over and then we keep moving on. We can't, you can't go picking up a truffle and then having a sniff of it, looking at it, and then going, okay, it's not ripe, and planting it back. It doesn't work that way. Once you break that, that fungal network link, the mycelium, it's over. It'll start, basically, it's rotting process. So it's got to be left undisturbed. Hence why, again, after November, we don't go driving up and down the, the rows. We don't go digging. There's nothing like that. It has to be left in situ. It's all the microbial joins, the, the link between the, the truffle and the trees is all fungal network. So it's, it's very, very fine and finicky. So from there, you'll take it back. It'll go back to the grading room. Um, it will be graded in there. It'll be washed first and then graded. So from the grading process, it's done on size. It's also done on ripeness. If it's not ripe, it might have a slight red tinge to the outside and the inside will be white. Um, at that stage, it's, it's of no use. So that goes back to, again, to staff training. So we have to ensure that the people in the paddocks are bringing in ripe truffles. We don't want these. It's a waste otherwise. Easing a perfect truffle from the soil causes almost as much excitement as uncovering a gold nugget. But what actually separates the excellent from the merely okay? Rich black. Just that lovely, really deep brown on the outside. It'll have a... You can walk up and actually just pick up the soil and you'll smell it before even putting it to your nose. It's got that earthy, mushroomy type smell. It's, it's a really rich, deep smell. Um, the perfect ideal ones would all be, you know, a, a golf ball and thereabouts perfectly round. That's not realistic. Um, you do get some of them, but they're not all that way. But it's the, it's the aroma. It's that smell of the, mixed with the soil. That's what excites me the most. It's, that's what you're after. Really dark, dark inner um, with a nice vein. So it's sort of like the, um, it's the marbling in a, in a steak. Um, you want it as dark as you can get it. In the earliest part of the season, it'll be more of a tan colour. Um, it's the, the longer the season goes on, obviously the darker it gets and the more ar aromatic it gets. So the darker it is, generally speaking, the better it is. No farmer has certainty, but truffle farming is particularly dicey. How does Jeff deal with the ups and downs that eat into profit? It's just, uh, it's very, very hit and miss. You just, you, you, you hope for the highest and if you, yeah, there's... There's, there's no such thing as a, as a perfect harvest, unfortunately. You want as many as you can get. Like all farming practices, your input costs versus output costs, you want to reduce as many as much as you can. If your input costs are set, um, which most of ours are, it's, it's trying to get the most out of our outputs. So if we can try and get the, the higher outputs, obviously, then our cost of production per kilogram, that's the other thing. So we, we also want to try and minimise things like rot, um, rot does come out of our overheads. So the more rot we have, then obviously the higher the cost of production because we want, that means that we potentially, there's been too much rain. Um, maybe the, the, the blocks haven't been harvested heavy enough. Um, there's, a, there's a number of factors that come into it, but it's rot is, I suppose, the sort of thing that we try and minimise where we can. It's just another cost of production, unfortunately, for us. Truffles are quick to spoil. 
What did Jeff and Louisa do with their trimmings? And which truffle products are best for farmers and consumers? So we do um, a series of salts. Um, obviously, the, the product with, with truffle, the, the disadvantage, I suppose, for us is that it only has a shelf life of a couple of weeks. So once when it comes to fresh. Um, when it's out of season, that's obviously out of the question for um, what we can do with the truffles. We do use freeze dry. So with freeze dry, it can obviously extend the life for a couple of years. Um, it will reduce the, the physical quantity of it down around about 80%. So we lose a lot of the volume and a lot of the weight. Um, so from our point of view, it's, you know, it's, an, it's an expensive product that ends up becoming even more expensive because obviously that loss of, of 80% of the, of the volume. Um, the advantage is it can become a staple in the pantry. It can be left in the pantry for a couple of years. People can use it on the likes of pastas and steaks. That moisture, um, the heat and the moisture from the food, that actually helps to reconstitute and the heat starts getting for the, um, the taste back in. So it's, you know, it's great for people travelling. We get a lot of people come to the farm. They go, obviously they buy it, but it's, it's a nice small compact thing that they can use then at any stage. So regardless of seasons. Um, the salts, obviously there's a range of salts as well. Um, and they're fantastic. As I said, the, the tradie in me says that things, anything when it comes on to steak is always good. Steak, mashed potato, the pepperberry salt, uh, the pepperberry salt is fantastic for that. Yeah. It's, um, again, I, I let my wife cook all that sort of thing because it would be end up being probably charcoal if I cooked it. Uh, but yeah, no, she's, it, it's amazing what that can do as well. And again, it's any time of the year. <laughs> Growing, harvesting and grading truffles is the foundation, but produce needs to get to market. How does that work here? So obviously there's, there's a few different ways that we can do um, we, what we can do with the, the actual product. We can go direct through to the, um, to the end user or the, um, the restaurants. Um, so that's, that's the ideal way. Um, it's, it's obviously the, ad, the advantage is for us is that we end up with um, relationships direct through to restaurants and chefs. We can also obviously, uh, the, the general public, so we try and, we also obviously encourage people to buy direct from farm. Um, again, they end up with a product that's slightly cheaper for them. Um, and obviously we cut out, cut out, it cuts out middlemen. And then obviously there's a wholesale market as well. So the wholesalers are there, it's, it's, it's another thing. It's, it's great, the, the relationships with them are fantastic because they can obviously move quantity. So, they're there to make money, so are we. So, which is it's a it's a mutual bond with us. So, the last of them is we can then do um, product. So, we obviously have product that we sell direct on, on farm. So, and we do markets and things like that. So, these yeah, it's a it's a mix. There's a, obviously different ways that we try and um, that we try and market and promote our product. It's often the case that farmers find a whole new level of appreciation for the produce they work so hard to get to market when they eat it in a restaurant. Jeff shares a key experience at Hobart restaurant Pepina. We went to Massimo's um, Pepina down at Battery Point um, and that was the, the first time that we truly experienced what they what you can do with them. Um, what he He's a magician when it comes to food so what that was the one true thing he um what he did well I'll, it'll be a meal that i'll never forget so that's that's what i compare truffles to now that's my memories if someone asked me what truffles taste like it brings me straight back into pepina the day that he walked out there and shaved truffles um at our table that's that was the day so it was the irony was the people next to us actually put a complaint in that they got more truffles. why did they get so many truffles and he explained to them that they own the truffle farm so it was, um, it was quite amusing to see someone complain that someone else got too many truffles. It was the, um, it was the, the aroma. It was the, the aromas more than the taste even for me. Um, and that was the thing that, yeah, that got me was the, yeah, it was the aroma. And what it does is just, it completely just finishes off a meal. Life on the land is not easy, but it's a life Jeff and Louisa are glad they've chosen for their family. What are the ups and downs? Like anything, like and especially farming, goods and bads. Um, it's it's that I sometimes you sit there one day, some days, and think. And I said to the accountant there not that long ago, I said I think that farming is probably the worst business model in Australia in the economy. Um, and I think every farmer probably agrees with that. Um, we we laugh about it with the next door neighbour. Um, he's a dairy farmer, and he laughs about the um, the impact of farming and whatnot. But 
It's it's given our kids. We've got a um, ten year old and a thirteen year old. Um, it's given our kids something that you know that was an opportunity they never had. Um, we were Louise and I were both brought up on properties um, in Queensland, so certainly not truffle farming. But it was um, yeah, it, it's it. it it gave us the opportunity to give our kids something as well, just to, to experience that sort of thing. Um, my daughter here, she's got two sheep that are running up and down the paddocks here somewhere. Um, and apparently this week we're getting more lambs, I hear. But it's, again, you know, we've got a 13-year-old who drives, who can drive a car, a manual ute, around the, around the farm. It's, it gives that experiences for the kids. It's something that they, that's something that can't be taken away from them. My 10 year old was teaching over Christmas. We had our, um, our nieces and nephews and, and um, the in-laws here. And my 10 year old was teaching her 21 year old cousin how to drive a manual ute. It was quite scary because she'd only ever had one car lesson, a car driving lesson in a manual. But it, nevertheless, she, she still gave it a crack. So yeah, it's given them a, 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 it's given the kids a lot of confidence. Um, it's probably given my wife and I a fair few more grey hairs, but um, it's something to it's always something as I said, always up for a challenge. Truffles are unique, which is the magic and the heartbreak. Jeff shares what he finds special about where he lives and what he does. There's nothing else that I can think of that is grown in that way. There's the, the risk from a, from a production point of view, the risk that's involved in actually in getting those things that see people see on Instagram. You know, they, they think, I think that some people think that it's just a, a truffle farm. These things are almost growing like, like apples. They don't. Um, the ones you see are, are such a small percentage of the ones that are actually produced. Um, you know the, the the wastage that unfortunately that that comes into it from rot or, or from you know vermin or th- things like that is quite high. Um, we've got these little batongs which are a native um, marsupial rat looking thing that's um, here in Tassie. And if you if you Google batong uh, diet, it says truffle. Fantastic. So I think that they've probably got one of the most expensive diets in in the animal kingdom. Uh, which is quite scary, and here I am. I should have, obviously, I've probably got dozens of batons here that are loving me right now. But yeah, it's it's just the uniqueness of a product that is is grown and and has to be harvested by an anim- by a dog. Um, there's no machines. We can't mechanise this. Um, the closest thing we've done to mechanisation on this farm is we bought bigger lawnmowers and we put radios and and they've got air conditioning. That's as close as we can get. We can't. There's, there's no way that we can streamline this process any, any, any more. So, yeah, that's, that's, I suppose, from my point of view, that's, that's the thing that makes it so unique, this product, and that's, it, it, it will never change from that. It's, it's just quiet. You're walking up and down rows of trees. Um, you know, you, you hear, you can hear next to nothing, and that's the, the pleasantness of it, and... I remember one day someone said to me, um, it was a tourist from Sydney, and he came here and he said, how do you live here? And I couldn't quite work out where he was going with it. And he, I said, why is that? And he said, there's just no one here. I said, that's, that's the appeal. And he said, yeah, but what about at night? He said, you can't see anything. I said, well, turn the light on. So he, he couldn't, and I suppose this is the, the, the difference in the upbringings that we've both had, he couldn't, he couldn't see what it's like living not next to anyone. I can't see any of our neighbours. Like the closest neighbour we have is about 1.1 kilometres down the road. The closest house I can see from here is around about 10 or 15 kilometres away. Um, it's a it's a really well positioned property where we don't we're not enclosed, and that's 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 a great appeal to us. So again, walking along behind a dog, sitting there giving it a pat and a cuddle at the end of the rows, it's it's actually enjoyable. So. It's something, that's, it's something that a lot of people haven't experienced. We do tours um, on the farm and um, people, you see the people and it's mainly the kids that really, really get involved. Um, and the kids, to, to see a dog actually do something that's, you know, that they don't get to see. Everyone's got these great dreams that their little poodle or something at home is going to become a truffle dog. Um, we get told all the time, oh, my, my little banshee dog's going to become a, is going to be a fantastic truffle dog because it's got a good nose. No problems. So teach your way, it's, it's not that hard. As relatively new farmers in northern Tasmania, Jeff and Lou are just getting started. What are their plans? We'll see what the future brings, I don't know. Um, hopefully the, the truffle industry, you know, that's hopefully it's, 
if we can get it to actually the, from an industry perspective to get more home cooks using it um, not just make it a, a delicacy I think that's that's an important factor is that we've got to try and make the the consumers not be scared of the product and I think there's a there's an element there that they're scared of what it is they're scared to use it and they shouldn't be um, they use mushrooms quite comfortably I can't see why they, they wouldn't use this it's it's all part of the fungus it's just a fungus um, yeah I, th I think that's the future that we need to be aiming for is to try and get the general public to actually want to use it and have a go walking outside jumping on a on a gator and going for a drive around or you know, there's a what we what we live on people can dream of so there's about 40 odd ducks in the top dam we go up there and feed the ducks or i jumped on a lawnmower yesterday afternoon and drove around in circles on a lawnmower um it was fantastic it's it's those sorts of things that you don't get to do elsewhere so and again i don't look over my fence and have to talk to my neighbor if i don't want to truffles are shrouded in mystery it's their appeal, but it's also a potential barrier to farming success. Jeff and Louisa Anderson have made a great lifestyle move for their family and they continue to make bold decisions and put in the hard work for Truffles of Tasmania. They offer delicious truffles, value-add products and educational farm tours that show off what's so special about Northern Tasmania. This is The Producers, a Deep in the Weeds production. I'm Danny Vallant. Stay tuned as we talk to some of Australia's best farmers, makers and growers. Follow us on Instagram at Producers Podcast or contact us via deepintheweeds.com.au.